section two of deportation its meaning and menace last message to the people of america by alexander berkman and emma goldman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand what's to be done men and women of america there is much work to be done if you hate injustice and tyranny if you love liberty and beauty there is work for you if oppression rouses your indignation and the sight of misery and ugliness makes you unhappy there is work for you if your country is dear to you and the people your kin there is work for you there is much to be done whoever you are artist or educator writer or worker be you but a true man or true woman there is important work for you let not prejudice and narrow-mindedness blind you let not a false press mislead you permit not this country to sink to the depths of despotism do not stand supinely by while every passing day strengthens reaction rouse yourself and others to resent injustice and every outrage on liberty demand an open mind and fair hearing for every idea hold sacred the right of expression protect the freedom of speech and press suffer not thought to be forcibly limited and opinions prescribed make conscience free undisciplined allow no curtailment of aspiration and ideas these are the levers of progress the fountainhead of joy and beauty join your efforts lovers of humanity do not uphold the hand that strangles life Align yourself with the dreamers of the better day. The cause is worthy, the need urgent. The future looks towards you, its voice calls you, calls. May it not call in vain. And you, fellow workers in factory, mine, and field, a great mission is yours. You, the feeders of the world and the creators of its wealth, you are the most interested in the fate of your country. The menace of despotism is greatest to you. Long has your master's service humiliated and degraded you. Will you permit yourselves to be driven into still more abject slavery? Your emancipation is your work. Others may help, but you alone can win. In shop and union, take up this your greatest problem. Let not the least of you be victimized. Remember, an injury to one is the concern of all. No worker can stand alone in the face of organized capitalism with all its legislative and military weapons. Learn solidarity, each with a common purpose, all with a common effort. Know your enemy. There is no mutual interest between the robber and the robbed. Understand your true friends. You'll always find them maligned and persecuted by your enemies. The idealists, the seekers of the slaveless world, speak from your heart. Give them hearing. Your fate, the fate of the country, is in your hands. Yours is the mightiest power. There is no strength in the government except you give it. No strength in your masters except you suffer it. The only true mastery is in you, the working class, in your power to feed and clothe the world and make it joyous. The greatest power for good or evil. Use it for liberty, for justice. Allow no suppression of the freedom of thought and speech, for it is a snare for your undoing. Sooner or later every suppression comes home to labor for its greater enslavement. Realize the menace of deportation, of the principle of banishment and exile. Tis the latest method of the American plutocracy to silence the discontent of the workers. Lose no time. It is of the most vital importance to you. It threatens you, your union, your very existence. Take the matter up in your organizations. The fortunes of labor in America are at stake. Only your united effort can conquer the peril that menaces you. Take action. Rouse the workers of the whole country. In union and solidarity, in clear purpose and courage is your only salvation. Quotations from American and foreign authors which would fall under the criminal anarchy law, espionage law, etc. These authors, distinguished thinkers, philosophers, and humanitarians of world-wide renown, would, if still alive and of foreign birth, not be permitted on American shores if they tried to land here, or if born Americans, they would be threatened by deportation to the island of Guam. Abraham Lincoln The man who will not investigate both sides of a question is dishonest. The cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even one hundred defeats. The authors of the Declaration of Independence meant it to be a stumbling block to those who in after times might seek to turn free people back into the paths of despotism. I have always thought that all men should be free, but if any should be slaves, it should be first those who desire it for themselves, and secondly those who desire it for others. If there is anything that is the duty of the whole people never to entrust to any hands but their own, that thing is the preservation and perpetuity of their own liberties. Thomas Jefferson All eyes are opening to the right of man. 
the general spread of the light of science has already laid open to every view the palpable truth that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs nor a favored few booted and spurred ready to ride them legitimately by the grace of god societies exist under three forms sufficiently distinguishable one without government as among our indians two under governments wherein the will of every one has a just influence as is the case in england in a slight degree and in our states in a great degree three under governments of force as is the case in all other monarchies and in most of the other republics to have an idea of the curse of existence under these last they must be seen it is a government of wolves over sheep it is a problem not clear in my mind that the first condition is not the best but i believe it to be inconsistent with any great degree of population the second state has a great deal of good in it the mass of mankind under that enjoys a precious degree of liberty and happiness it has evils too the principle of which is the turbulence to which it is subject but weigh this against the oppression of monarchy and it becomes nothing even this evil is productive of good it prevents the degeneracy of governments and nourishes a general attention to the public affairs i hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing and as necessary in the political world as storms in the physical unsuccessful rebellions indeed generally establish the encroachments on the rights of the people which have produced them an observation of this truth should render honest republican governors so mild in their punishment of rebellions as not to discourage them too much it is a medicine necessary for the sound health of governments we have long enough suffered under the base prostitution of law to party passions in one judge and the imbecility of another it is error alone which needs the support of government truth can stand by itself william lloyd garrison liberty for each for all and for ever no person will rule over me with my consent i will rule over no man enslave the liberty of but one human being and the liberties of the world are put in peril when i look at these crowded thousands and see them trample on their consciences and the rights of their fellow men at the bidding of a piece of parchment i say my curse be on the constitution of the united states why sir no freedom of speech or inquiry is conceded to me in this land am i not vehemently told both at the north and the south that i have no right to meddle with the question of slavery and my right to speak on any other subject in opposition to public opinion is equally denied to me i am aware that many object to the severity of my language but is there not cause for severity i will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice on this subject i do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation no no tell a man whose house is on fire to give moderate alarm tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present i am earnest i will not equivocate i will not excuse i will not retreat a single inch and i will be heard the apathy of the people is enough to make every statue leap from its pedestal and hasten to the resurrection of the dead in the first issue of the liberator january one eighteen thirty one wendell phillips if there is anything that cannot bear free thought let it crack nothing but freedom justice and truth is of any permanent advantage to the mass of mankind to these society left to itself is always tending the right to think to know and utter as john milton said is the dearest of all liberties without this right there can be no liberty to any people with it there can be no slavery when you have convinced thinking men that it is right and humane men that it is just you will gain your cause men always lose half of what is gained by violence what is gained by argument is gained forever the manna of liberty must be gathered each day or it is rotten only by unintermitted agitation can a people be kept sufficiently awake to principle not to let liberty be smothered in material prosperity let us believe that the whole truth can never do harm to the whole of virtue and remember that in order to get the whole of truth you must allow every man right or wrong freely to utter his conscience and protect him in so doing entire unshackled freedom for every man's life no matter how wide its range the community which dares not protect its humblest and most hated member in the free utterance of his opinions no matter how false or hateful is only a gang of slaves stephen pearl andrews governments have hitherto been established and have apologized for the unseemly fact of their existence from the necessity of establishing and maintaining order but order has never yet been maintained revolutions and violent outbreaks have never yet been ended 
public peace and harmony have never yet been secured for the precise reason that the organic essential and indestructible natures of the objects which it was attempted to reduce to order have always been constricted and infringed by every such attempt just in proportion as the effort is less and less made to reduce men to order just in that proportion they become more orderly as witness the difference in the state of society in austria and the united states plant an army of one hundred thousand soldiers in new york as at paris to preserve the peace and we should have a bloody revolution in a week and be assured that the only remedy for what little of turbulence remains among us as compared with european societies will be found to be more liberty when there remain positively no external restrictions there will be positively no disturbance provided always certain regulating principles of justice to which i shall advert presently are accepted and enter into the public mind serving as substitutes for every species of repressive laws henry george in our time as in times before creep on the insidious forces that producing inequality destroy liberty on the horizon the clouds begin to lower liberty calls to us again we must follow her further we must trust her fully either we must wholly accept her or she will not stay it is not enough that men should vote it is not enough that they should be theoretically equal before the law they must have liberty to avail themselves of the opportunities and means of life they must stand on equal terms with reference to the bounty of nature either this or liberty withdraws her light either this or darkness comes on and the very forces that progress has evolved turn to powers that work destruction this is the universal law this is the lesson of the centuries unless its foundations be laid in justice the social structure cannot stand henry david thoreau law never made men a whit more just and by means of their respect for it even the well-disposed are daily made the agents of injustice a common and natural result of an undue respect for law is that you may see a file of soldiers colonel captain corporal privates powder monkeys and all marching in admirable order over hill and dale to the wars against their wills ay against their common sense and consciences which makes it very steep marching indeed and produces a palpitation of the heart they have no doubt that it is a damnable business in which they are concerned they are all peaceably inclined now what are they men at all or small movable forts and magazines at the service of some unscrupulous man in power the mass of men serve the state thus not as men mainly but as machines with their bodies they are the standing army and the militia jailers constables posse comitatus etc in most cases there is no free exercise whatever of the judgment or of the moral sense but they put themselves on a level with wood and earth and stones and wooden men can perhaps be manufactured that will serve the purpose as well such command no more respect than men of straw or a lump of dirt they have the same sort of worth only as horses and dogs yet such as even these are commonly esteemed as good citizens others as most legislators politicians lawyers ministers and office holders serve the state chiefly with their heads and as they rarely make any moral distinctions they are as likely to serve the devil without intending it as god how does it become a man to behave toward this american government today i answer that he cannot without disgrace be associated with it i cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government which is the slave's government also all men recognize the right of revolution that is the right to refuse allegiance to and to resist the government when its tyranny or its inefficiency are great and unendurable ralph waldo emerson it will never make any difference to a hero what the laws are for what avail the plough or sail or land or life if freedom fail the wise know that foolish legislation is a rope of sand which perishes in the twisting our distrust is very expensive the money we spend for courts and prisons is very ill laid out every actual state is corrupt good men must not obey the laws too well what satire on government can equal the severity of the censure conveyed in the word politics which now for ages has signified cunning intimating that the state is a trick no law can be sacred to me but that of my nature good and bad are but names very readily transferable to this or that the only right is what is after my constitution the only wrong is what is against it a man is to carry himself in the presence of all opposition as if everything were titular and ephemeral but him i am ashamed to think how easily we capitulate to badges and names to large societies and dead institutions edmund burke all writers on the science of policy are agreed and they agree with experience that all governments must frequently infringe the rules of justice to support themselves that truth must give way to dissimulation honesty to convenience and humanity to the reigning interest 
the whole of this mystery of iniquity is called the reason of state it is a reason which i own i cannot penetrate what sort of a protection is this of the general right that is maintained by infringing the rights of particulars what sort of justice is this which is enforced by breaches of its own laws these paradoxes i leave to be solved by the able heads of legislators and politicians for my part i say what a plain man would say on such occasion i can never believe that any institution agreeable to nature and proper for mankind could find it necessary or even expedient in any case whatsoever to do what the best and worthiest instinct of mankind warn us to avoid but no wonder that what is set up in opposition to the state of nature should preserve itself by trampling upon the law of nature thomas paine to argue with a man who has renounced his reason is like giving medicine to the dead the more perfect civilization is the less occasion has it for government because the more does it regulate its own affairs and govern itself but so contrary is the practice of old governments to the reason of the case that the expenses of them increase in the proportion they ought to diminish it is but few general laws that civilized life requires and those of such common usefulness that whether they are enforced by the forms of government or not the effect will be nearly the same if we consider what the principles are that first condense man into society and what the motives that regulate their mutual intercourse afterwards we shall find by the time we arrive at what is called government that nearly the whole of the business is performed by the natural operation of the parts upon each other society in every state is a blessing but government even in its best state is but a necessary evil in its worst state an intolerable one the trade of governing has always been monopolized by the most ignorant and the most rascally individuals of mankind john stuart mill mankind can hardly be too often reminded that there was once a man named socrates between whom and the legal authorities and public opinion of his time there took place a memorable collision born in an age and country abounding in individual greatness this man has been handed down to us by those who best knew both him and the age as the most virtuous man in it while we know him as the head and prototype of all subsequent teachers of virtue the source equally of the lofty inspiration of plato and the judicious utilitarianism of aristotle the two head springs of ethical as of all other philosophy their acknowledged master of all the eminent thinkers who have since lived whose fame still growing after more than two thousand years all but outweighs the whole remainder of the names which make his native city illustrious was put to death by his countrymen after a judicial conviction for impiety and immorality impiety in denying the gods recognized by the state indeed his accusers asserted see the apologia that he believed in no gods at all immorality in being by his doctrines and instructions a corrupter of youth of these charges the tribunal there is every ground for believing honestly found him guilty and condemned the man who probably of all of them born had deserved best of mankind to be put to death as a criminal herbert spencer when we have made our constitution purely democratic thinks to himself the earnest reformer we shall have brought government into harmony with absolute justice such a faith though perhaps needful for the age is a very erroneous one by no process can coercion be made equitable the freest form of government is only the least objectionable form the rule of the many by the few we call tyranny the rule of the few by the many is tyranny also only of a less intense kind you shall do as we will and not as you will is in either case the declaration and if the hundred make it to ninety-nine instead of the ninety-nine to the hundred it is only a fraction less immoral of two such parties whichever fulfills this declaration necessarily breaks the law of equal freedom the only difference being that by the one it is broken in the persons of ninety-nine whilst by the other it is broken in the persons of a hundred and the merit of the democratic form of government consists solely in this that it trespasses against the smallest number the very existence of majorities and minorities is indicative of an immoral state the man whose character harmonizes with the moral law we found to be the one who can obtain complete happiness without establishing the happiness of his fellows but the enactment of public arrangements by vote implies a society consisting of men otherwise constituted implies that the desires of some cannot be satisfied without sacrificing the desires of others implies in the pursuit of their happiness the majority inflict a certain amount of unhappiness on the minority implies therefore organic immorality thus from another point of view we again perceive that even in its most equitable form it is impossible for government to disassociate itself from evil and further that unless the right to ignore the state is recognized its acts must be essentially criminal leof and tolstoy the cause of the miserable condition of the workers is slavery 
the cause of slavery is legislation legislation rests on organized violence it follows that an improvement in the condition of the people is possible only through the abolition of organized violence but organized violence is government and how can we live without governments without governments there will be chaos anarchy all the achievements of civilization will perish and the people will revert to their primitive barbarism but why should we suppose this why think that non-official people could not arrange it not for themselves but for others we see on the contrary that in the most diverse matters people in our times arrange their own lives incomparably better than those who govern them arrange for them without the least help from the government and often in spite of the interference of government people organize all sorts of social undertakings workmen's unions cooperative societies railway companies and syndicates if collections for public works are needed why should we suppose that free people could not without violence voluntarily collect the necessary means and carry out all that is carried out by means of taxes if only the undertakings in question are really useful for anybody why suppose that there cannot be tribunals without violence the robber generally plundered the rich the governments generally plunder the poor and protect those rich who assist in their crimes the robber doing his work risked his life while the government risks nothing but base their whole activity on lies and deception the robber did not compel anyone to join his band the governments generally enroll their soldiers by force all who paid the tax to the robber had equal security from danger but in the state the more anyone takes part in the organized fraud the more he receives not merely of protection but also of reward End of section two. End of deportation, its meaning and menace, last message to the people of America by Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman.